Welcome to Feeling Asian, a podcast where two Asians talk about their feelings. I'm Young Me Mayor. And I'm Brian Park. And oh my God. We have yeah. a spicy episode for y'all today. Wow. Yes. Asians like it spicy. Is that is that too general? Some Asians don't like spicy. It's okay if you're an Asian who doesn't <laughs> like spicy. You live your truth. You just existing is is uh, subverting every stereotype. <laughs> no, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's not okay. It's not okay to be Asian and not like spicy. Brian Your experience Park, is invalid. Brian Park, who famously didn't eat kimchi until he was a full-blown adult, <laughs> is saying it's not okay if you don't like spicy. A little bit of a hypocrite, but <laughs> let's introduce our <laughs> guest because you probably heard her right now. Let's just do, let's just do it, Brian. All right, let's do it. Uh, listeners, our guest this week is a professional dominatrix. <gasps> Give your ears to On Lee. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hi, I'm on Lee. Is that is that? What's up? Thanks for joining us. Uh, before. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to, b- listeners a peek behind the curtain before we started recording. We had to, we had to figure. I had to nail down the title, professional dominatrix, because apparently whatever I was saying before was very cringe. I was. I learned that it's actually called pro dom. I wanted to go professional mm-hmm. dom, pro dominatrix. Yeah. It was all cringe. Yeah. It was all cringe. Yeah. Brian was embarrassing <laughs> me. I was like, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian was hello, fellow kids. Like he was doing that. Yeah. I feel like. <laughs> I know. I was the only one. I was like, are you sure we could just go by pro dom? Are people going to know that? Can we, can we be thorough and say professional dominatrix and begrudgingly on on Lee said it was okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's a, it's a word. It's a, it's a word that people get. <laughs> Brian has to work on his lingo. Yeah, I know. I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But Anli, thanks for joining us on the podcast. And, you know, I, I'm sure our listeners want to learn all about you. But before we ask how you're feeling. Brian, Brian, how are you feeling? Tell us how you're okay. feeling. I'm going first this week. <laughs> you always make um, me go first. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, I'm feeling... Okay, I'm feeling uh, very stressed. Uh-oh. Ahead of our live show next week. Oh, God. Uh, I always get stressed before the live show mm-hmm. because, you know, obviously we want it to go well and uh, it's just stressful. I think regardless of anything, mm-hmm. if there's a deadline, this has always been a thing for me, even in mm-hmm. school. I could have studied a million hours. I'm super prepared, but I'm going to be stressed regardless. I'm so jealous of people who are like, yeah, I prepared. I'm going to kill it tomorrow and then get a good <laughs> night's sleep. That that doesn't happen to me. So I've been very stressed. And as a side effect of that, I... My IBS has flared up again. Oh, God. Oh, no. It's <laughs> not, not, not good. It's not good. It's not, not good. IBS. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not as bad as it was uh, in, in the fourth quarter of 2021 where <laughs> I took quarter. all of I, I took us all on that journey where there, there was a if you notice in the fourth quarter of Feeling Asian podcast, there was a lot of uh, discussion surrounding uh, fecal matter. That came but, out of Brian's butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think I'm more equipped to handle it this go around. And I don't think it's going to be as destabilizing or debilitating to my life. So, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Short and sweet. That, that sounds how- kind of terrifying. The the destabilization element of it. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> oh, I, gosh. Yeah. I know. Well, but I think what helps is that I know exactly what it is and i can put a name to it and i know that it's not permanent whereas before i got a medical professional to review what was going on with my body uh i was just like in a constant state of anxiety of like you just thought that was you like yeah is it gonna happen again (laughs) yeah yeah but it's in line i'm stressed therefore ibs flare up but we're chilling we're here (laughs) <laughs> nevertheless she persisted we're doing well <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of 
yeah it's a lot of pressure i mean i know that poo is funny and i like i'm fighting the urge to laugh about it but also it's like <laughs> pooing is like a big part of your body's like natural function and if it's not oh. functioning properly <laughs> it's debilitating you know and i and i do feel for people i'm sure that are out there listening that also have ibs and they probably know exactly how you're feeling where you're like i can't go out because i have to like plan all the bathrooms on the way which is something you talked about a while ago yeah. like that's fucking yeah <laughs> that is debilitating you know yeah 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 but yeah <laughs> thank you thank you thank you for not laughing and thank you for not making me feel ashamed or embarrassed um i mean i did but, laugh yeah. a little bit in the beginning i'm not <laughs> <laughs> no it's warranted it's absolutely warranted um but yeah enough about uh this poo talk young me how are you feeling <laughs> poo talk well i was i feel kind of bad because i was like i am one of those people that never study in school i mean i wasn't even prepared i would just never prepared period but i would always feel super like chill about everything like i would like a test would be coming up would not prepare a single fucking second just fucking waltz in and i would always do pretty well like that was like my entire life but then i, I think it's also because like the second that anything was hard i would just give up and like never try anyway so like i never yeah it, it's like it's like that was like my response to anxiety was just to like ugh, like never do that because that feels bad um but i but i i never get nervous or anxious about things that i think i'm not going to use the word never but i typically don't get nervous or anxious about things that other people do that make sense like oh i have a big show like i never get nervous about the live shows like i'm like excited to do it but i don't feel mm -hmm. like anxious for that i would i don't feel anxious about uh those things if that makes sense okay but yeah but then i'm also thinking maybe i do and then i'm dissociating do you know what I mean? Cause mm. then like, cause then this happens to me a lot. Like I'll go to like a big, like a show, like a live show. Um, and then afterward I'll feel fucking crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> then I'm like, <sighs> and I think that's where all my anxiety, I, I almost feel like now that it's safe, my body is like, okay, I'm going to let you feel these feelings now or something. like now that it's over. Do you know what I mean? So I also just think, that's a high you get from performing because it is like yeah, a maybe. crazy dopamine rush to perform yeah. in front of a live audience. I know I have trouble sleeping at night after performances because yeah. like, yeah, similar to you, like my body's all tingly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I just don't feel like nervous about stuff. Sometimes I feel nervous about stand up, but I, I don't even know mm. that, that that's a I, I don't even think I'm like. It affects me that hard. But I really yeah. think, not to be negative on myself, I really think that it's like a dissociating thing. I don't think it's like, mm. like I'm just strong. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I feel yeah, like yeah, yeah. I'm pushing it to another place or something. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I don't want you to feel bad, but just know that my intestines are, are dying <laughs> for our art. <laughs> <laughs> um I, yeah so i guess what am i feeling i'm feeling very uh good i feel like i'm d getting a lot of stuff done every day and i feel very um organized and i am feeling very excited about our podcast obviously on lee's mm -hmm. here and i'm really excited about this episode because we you know discussed what we were going to get to on the episode and that was that discussion really excited me or you know the anticipating yeah, yeah. that and the last few episodes that we've had on the podcast, like every single guest I thought was like just so amazing. And it, I've, I've like had a, I think there was a little period of time in the end of last year where I was feeling a little overwhelmed by the podcast and I, I wasn't like really tapping in and I feel like very reinvigorated with it. So that's how I'm feeling. Um, how about you, Anli? How are you feeling? Um, well, first off, I am feeling pretty good about the poop talk because I feel like it, whenever anyone talks about poop, it just makes me feel at home, yes. you know, because <laughs> I think, I think it's an Asian thing or maybe it's like a non-white thing where you just like extensively talk about the details of your, your fecal routine. I actually, <laughs> one of my, um, a good set of friends, we have a group called the food poopers and we talk about food yes. and our poop. Whoa. And one of them is actually here right now. Oh, the, the one who got poopers. me on this podcast. The poopers are here. 
<laughs> um, Wait, I'm spiraling. Yeah, so. Sorry to like, interrupt. Am I pronouncing your name right? Yes. Oh, okay, I mean, it's, okay, I was spiraling. So I was like spiraling for a second. Ultimately, yeah. it's like a fake Asian name that isn't actually pronounced oh, okay. correctly in Chinese. And I was I named see. it by someone else who was not a Mandarin speaker. So it's like... Yeah, it's right. I don't know. Oh, okay. It's, Sorry. I have, I have, I have conflicted feelings about performance names that sound Asian, but mm. um, yeah. Yes, so, it's right. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. You were saying the food poopers are here. Exciting. Yeah, one what of them is here. Rebecca, <laughs> the one who got me uh, forcibly, like Tiger mommed me onto this podcast, which I'm very stoked on because uh, I just your, it's, your it's life cool. has been ruined ever since. <laughs> She is um, the uh, loving maternal presence I never had. And uh, yeah, I'm um, pretty nervous right now because I spent a lot of hours listening to you guys while I'm like taking dog walks. So I'm feeling, uh, Rebecca and I were just talking about this, how like we feel like we know you guys, but obviously I don't fucking know you guys. Like I just listen to your guys' voice like online, but it feels <laughs> like I know you guys. And so it's um, pretty cool. So I'm, I'm like a little, a little anxious about that, and uh, I'm kind of stressed out because I'm flying to Vegas after this. Oh, wow. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna get COVID. Mm. I just, how could uh. I not get COVID in Vegas? How could I not get COVID in Vegas? I don't know. I feel like I'm gonna get COVID, so I'm, I'm not looking forward to that. But it's a work thing, so I'm gonna be in Vegas, and I need to right. think about things that I well, have to pack. If, and if it makes you feel better, I was in Vegas. Uh, kind of recently and I didn't get COVID while I was mm -hmm. there. So, And, you know, my partner was in Vegas two times over the pandemic and he didn't get COVID either, wow. but I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be me. Like, I feel yeah. like half my friends have fucking COVID right now. So, mm -hmm. I, And you're based in LA, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Cause I was like, I feel like everyone in New York already got COVID. So I was like, wait, you didn't get COVID yet. But then I'm like, okay, wait, that's how, <laughs> but also I haven't got, I didn't get COVID either during the surge in New York and I'm traveling next mm -hmm. week. And now I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, what, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. And just like stacked up in between various travels. It's like, am I concerned that I'm going to get terrible health effects from COVID? Not really, because mm -hmm. I'm vaccinated and like the likelihood is low. Mm -hmm. But do I want to take off two weeks or however long they're saying to oh, like, God. just get my shit together? You know, it's just like, mm. yeah. But, you know, money is money. And um, I'm lucky that i get to be paid to flow into vegas and go shopping and stuff like that so you know it's like uh it's a trade-off it's, uh, it's, it's a give and take yeah it's, it's a complaint <laughs> of privilege i suppose you're living brian's dream <laughs> <laughs> getting flown to vegas to go shopping <laughs> yeah well only yeah. um yeah well i think we should just jump right into our conversation young me yeah, how do you feel yeah, about that i i agree i think that we have so many things to talk about and i'm just like foaming at the mouth is that i don't know what kind of <laughs> 1907 that's a popular phrase from 1932 i'm foaming at the mouth to start this conversation <laughs> um so this is what we want to know about you on lee um you know i think i'm I'm speaking from personal experience, but also, uh, you know, from messages we received from our listeners. And that is uh, that first exploration into, quote unquote, taboo sexual practices can feel a bit daunting or even at times embarrassing. Um, you know, let's say like role play, for instance, like there's, there's that feeling of that self-awareness that you're like pretending, you know, and you're not out of your body and it you just feel like. Oh, I'm so awkward. Like, this is so weird. How do you overcome that pretend feeling or just in general, like become comfortable with this exploration? So I think the way I've viewed a lot of my femdom practice for me personally is it's almost like CBT, like psych psychology, CBT, not BDSM, CBT, psychology, CBT, meaning cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. which is like things if if you're raised in, okay, so for example, for me, like raised in a dysfunctional family where you have like bad self-esteem growing up or like you have trouble like trusting people or, or acting in a certain way, 
the only way you can really get past it is just by practicing things. And things always feel weird when you start, like swimming is going to feel weird when you start, like dancing is going to feel weird if you've never danced in your entire life. And it's something that you just kind of have to push through. Um, I'm like, I think things, no matter what, are always going to feel very awkward when you start. Like very few times will there be a moment in your life where you'd be like trying something completely new and being like, oh, all of this like is fitting together perfectly. Right. Like those moments are rare and special and they do happen and they're far and few in between, in my opinion. Um, but so, okay. I'm just like meandering. Okay. So for example, I really hated my feet growing up. Mm -hmm. I have super, super wide feet. It's really hard for me to wear shoes. My mom always made fun of me mm. and my feet because they were so fucking wide that I just like hated them. But I had this class, um, this femdom class when I started my very first year and the teacher at the time, she was like, okay, just say something nice about your feet. You know, and mm -hmm. I was like, I, I didn't have anything nice to say about them. And I was like, well, I, they support my whole body, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, I was yeah. like, you know, it, 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 it's like saying something nice about my feet felt pretty weird. Cause I was like, look at these fat fucking troll feet, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but I said it and I said it enough times where now I'm just like, oh yeah, they support my whole body. And that's, that's cool. You know, you just kind of have to say things enough times. You have to just try it out and keep on trying it out and keep on trying it out. And if you really want it, then at some point it's going to feel natural. Um, right. But I mean, I think we all feel awkward whenever we're doing something new, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it's just trusting that things will feel less awkward going on in the same way that like, it wasn't natural for me to walk into a room and be like, I'm a fucking goddess. Mm -hmm. But like, I've done it thousands of times now. Mm -hmm. um, right. And now I can do it. Do I understand there's like an element of role play in it and there like perhaps an element of camp and cheesiness to it? Mm. Yeah, but you can do it to the point where you're not like grossed out by yourself, you know? Mm. Yeah. So when yeah. you so like when you first started taking classes or um like exploring your interest in uh femdom, like it felt awkward for you but then you still kept going because you knew it like satiated a part of your brain that you were like oh this is still interesting i like this yeah like where did that yeah absolutely mean? okay i think well okay so i was the type of person and i've heard this from a lot of sex workers where like i was just really interested in sexuality mm -hmm. at a young age mm -hmm. and i don't know if that meant i was like horny or just interested in it because i honestly think everyone's fucking horny from junior high to high school you know so. like the people who aren't who aren't horny are far and few in between but mm -hmm. i had a lot of questions that i wanted to ask about it and i was very open about asking about it and i was like down to look at weird stuff and it wasn't like i was constantly like fapping away to it but it was more like, oh, look at this goatsy set. Look at how big his butthole could get. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy, right? <laughs> and then, uh, and so, like, a lot of people knew me as the person who was very experimental in sex, even though I didn't necessarily have any much sex at a young age. Right. Um, so, it's always been something that I knew I wanted to try, not necessarily. BDSM, well, maybe BDSM fetish. I knew I wanted to explore fetish. Like when I was, I want to say 12 or 13, um, I saw this, this porn, like a pay-per-view porn at my friend's place. Mm -hmm. We used your dad's account and it was called like Busty Cops 2. I want to like Cops two or two. three. Classic. I think it's, I think it was Busty Cops 2. Okay. Nice. And it's about, I love a sequel. It was, <laughs> it was about the, these cops that break into a porn mansion because crimes are happening. So, of course, they have to pretend to be porn stars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think the thing that, like, I watched it and, like, afterwards, I, I knew I wanted to make porn because there's this one scene and it was the, the most absurd scene. But they are, like, these two porn cops are coming back after a hard day of, like, fucking and sucking in the mansion and like they're back at the fucking police station taking a shower and there's a carton of eggs in the shower mm -hmm. and they just start like cracking the eggs in between their big busty boobs wow. and i was like this is the weirdest thing ever i want to make this stuff <laughs> and uh wow it was just it was stuff like that where i was like the the more kind of just uh absurd it was yeah. the more i wanted to do it and so mm. i've always felt that way about fetish stuff yeah. not necessarily that like all of it made me super horny, uh -huh. but that 
it was just really interesting to me and I wanted to explore that. Yeah. And so I just kept on doing so it. So you knew you liked it. You knew you had an interest in it and you wanted to pursue it. So that was what like fueled you past the like maybe the first few times where it felt awkward and humiliating. You know, this really this really like sounds like every almost everything that people pursue, you know, even in like comedy, it's like. I, I think a lot of people don't hear that message a lot because when people see people, you know, like you, like a uh, professional dominatrix, I don't, I don't know the term. Sorry. I forgot already. It's a pro dom. <laughs> it's a pro dom. <laughs> it's a prof, prof dom. Come on. Prof dom. <laughs> Um, so like, like when they see you, they're like, oh, they're, that's a natural. Like she was just like that day one. Or, you know, when they see a stand-up comedian, yeah. they're like, oh, they, they sound like they're just talking to a friend and they don't realize that it's like, no, I really wanted to do this. So I stuck to it when I fucking sucked yeah. for a lot. That's yeah, me, not sure. you, me personally. Uh, like I sucked for so long and I just kept doing it cause I really wanted to do it. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand that there's that shitty sucky period you know, that we all have to yeah. push through if you really want to do it. So I think that was like such a great way to explain it. I think that is such a great observation, young me. I also, I just want to add to that. I feel that sex is really hard to come back from when you feel that like failure or that rejection because mm. it's inherently so vulnerable, you know, like yeah, you're, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, mm -hmm. you're fucking naked with another person and like you're, you're fully exposed. And I feel like failures are like, that rejection because with stand-up or any job like yeah you'll bounce back but with sex like i'm speaking from my like personally here i'm like yeah. i don't oh it's the worst i can't like it, it takes so much harder it's so much harder for me to just like let go if like awkward encounters happen or if there is any form of like failure so or rejection that in the bedroom oh i forgot that's brian. so funny to me brian, this is brian's big he has a very big issue with this <laughs> i just realized like obviously i know but yeah brian is very <laughs> affected by this no i mean sorry brian if you're just Wait, me in the, world. <laughs> in the entire world <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's 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 pretty funny and ironic for me because for me stand-up is like one of the most horrifying things in the world I say it's and uh um, one of my friends asked me if I wanted to take a stand-up class with her at one point and I was I, my gut response was just like no fuck no and then I was like I should examine that but it's funny to me that like your big fear is uh, sexual stuff and I'm like ah, you fuck enough people it doesn't really matter it's just a numbers game you know you're bound to fail multiple times but stand-up it's like you're in front of hundreds of people just it's just like you're, you fail a hundred times faster is how I feel, how I see it. Yeah. But, Whoa. You know. well, I mean, yeah. I guess on the other end of things, like in exploring your fetishes, have there been any fetishes where maybe you didn't like, but then when you stuck, oh, yeah. when you mm. stuck with it and then you grew to like it or mm. I think, or well, so I think sexual stuff is I'm okay. So I'm less likely to like really push like, okay, so there's a there's a fine line between um, pushing something because you know it's something you want and pushing something even though you don't want it. Mm, you yeah. know, there's like, w w I don't really know where the line is between yeah. that. It's kind of just a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. But I think sexual stuff can be so triggering for a lot of people mm -hmm. that sometimes it don't push things that you don't want. Like, of course. If, if something makes you kind of feel queasy inside in not a good way, then um, don't do it. So, for example, there's there's certain fetishes that I just like, I'm not super fond of. I have friends who like it, are great at it, but I would never advertise it mm -hmm. on my end. Stuff like ABDL, which is adult baby diaper lover. Um, not my thing. Mm -hmm. Does some weird stuff to me mentally where mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, I'm like I have trouble parsing the fantasy from the reality of this. And it like makes me a little queasy. But at the same time, like I also shit on people. So my my spectrum of yeah. things that are okay are, are very like personal to me yeah. i don't like food play but i i don't mind feeding other people my shit you know it's like it's it's weird yeah it's yeah weird. it's like a, it's very personal i could see i could see that that like makes a lot of sense um and like er, like you said everyone has like their own life experiences and their own triggers that make them happy and bad do you so like what you said about the fetishes that you don't like because you do this as a profession are there times that you do do it for or with your clients even though you dislike it or 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, th I think that's just kind of capitalism yeah. in general, mm -hmm. right? Like not everything. On the one hand, I'm super lucky to be doing something that I love. On mm -hmm. the other hand, that doesn't mean that everything I do is something that I love, right, you know? Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't do things that like completely ick me out. Like I'm not really trying to like fuck people in a conventional sort of way and become an escort. Mm -hmm. Right. Although I suppose like there is a price for that and someone paid me enough money, I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I there's always things that I do that I'm like, mm, like, you know, you always have annoying clients or people who you, you don't really like as people, you know, and you still do the session, but um, you just kind of try to make it work. It's a service industry, right. ultimately, right? Mm. Um but I am lucky enough where I get to turn down a lot of people that I don't like and yeah. I don't think are compatible for me. What if mm. what if their kink was like you telling them that you didn't like them and then listing your reasons why? <laughs> that would oh, be I've totally so done that satisfying. Before. It was pretty good. I, so the funny thing is the people who want me to do that are oftentimes people that I like. And right, then it becomes sense. kind of weird. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh, but you're so sweet. And you want me to like say all these horrible things about you. So now I'm just going to, I don't know, talk about like the color of your hair or something, you know, something stupid. Mm. Um, I, I have had a couple of clients do that where it felt really warranted, but pretty much my favorite time to do something like that is if someone just really pisses me off and I just like lay it into them. But you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to be mean to people when really? you're coming from a bad place so mm. i don't advocate that even though i've done it oh uh, yeah my, that sounds um, like my fantasy <laughs> being mean to somebody <laughs> no sex just <laughs> just being mean i mean you could you could probably find that you're visible enough where i'm sure if you just looked in your dms you probably could find some like white dude being like be mean to me right should be i start mean. doing that i'm sure i'm like i'm sure you could okay I'm i think you could too <laughs> <laughs> um i i do want to you, you mentioned earlier how your relationship to bdsm is somewhat like cognitive behavioral therapy mm, in a way mm -hmm. and it's very psychological and i i want to revisit that because you know my therapist uh she well my therapist once like had this theory and she said that uh she felt that a lot of people were like interested in BDSM also as a means to like get out of their own head sexually because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's like this tertiary you're playing a role you're playing a part and like it helps for some people it alleviates anxiety you know you're a professional and you have a lot of experience uh, in this realm do you think there's truth to that and is oh, there like are, yeah. is, are all of these dynamics inherently psychological mm. um so the answer to the first question would be yes, and the answer to the second question would be no. Okay. Um, so when you talk about the first question, so for example, I have a lot of autistic clients. Mm. And part of the reason why they like BDSM is because there's a structure that is like very, very clear for them mm. that they can abide by, specifically like mm. high protocol kind of settings right. where they know like, I just listen to everything that you do and these are the things that will happen if I don't. And it's not like real life where like there are all these emotional undertones you have to read in between the lines. Sometimes mm. people say something, but they mean another. So um, I think it like there is a very large population of submissive clients who are in the spectrum and probably dominant clients who are in the spectrum, but I, I just don't, I don't Interact cater to those yeah. clients. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's that stereotype of like, you know, alpha male, C-level boss, fucking Fortune 500 company likes to get whipped in the basement, you know? Yeah. Um, and that that stereotype is true. Um, <laughs> I want to whip all those of my guys clients. too. Can I come and join <laughs> you? Do, they, do, do you need help? That. <laughs> I would love that. Kick those guys in the balls, right? <laughs> that's, that's, kicking them in the balls is great. I would I would highly I recommend want, that okay. if given the opportunity. Sorry to interrupt you, but don't you think that Jeff Bezos... <laughs> You know, you know he gets kicked in the balls by a dominatrix I'm on like, the reg. I have no look at I him. I wish. I feel like, I feel, I feel, yeah, yeah. Right? I feel like he has small dick energy, just based on how quickly he built muscle over the course of a of, of period of time. I love these theories. These are like I have I've never heard <laughs> of that. 
So he rapid built muscle gains fast. Is small dick energy. <laughs> well, yeah, I, w- I would say that. At, at the very least, it's small testicle we energy, right? Because yeah, like yeah. rapid gains is like usually steroids. Oh, steroids. I don't know. I don't know. That's, oh, you, yeah, yeah. That's like scientifically true. I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Although, I oh, like okay. maybe, I don't know how rapid that gain is. I've just seen the before and after of Jeff Bezos where he's like twerpy and then swollen. He got a BBL mm-hmm. for sure. He got some, some you know. <laughs> We know us. We know. Wait, wait. Sorry. What were you saying? I interrupted you. I just had to tell you my Jeff Bezos theory. <laughs> um. Oh, I was talking about. Uh, yeah, C level execs yeah. who want to get like whipped in a basement. And yeah, yeah those those stereotypes are true. Mm. Um, I would say definitely a lot of my clients cater to that. And then I also have like a lot of clients who are just submissive because like, or I'm I'm speaking more about my cis male clients, um, like they're just submissive people in general, you know, they're not necessarily like alpha types. They are just submissive, but society as at large currently doesn't really like beta males, you Mm -hmm. know, as beta males. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I'm an outlet for them to be seen and just understood. Mm. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely a fantasy component component of BDSM that makes it very escapist. And there's also a lot of like physiological things that can attribute to that. Mm. So for example, when you guys were talking about like feeling buzzy after a show, Mm -hmm. you know, I would say that um, in BDSM, there is like subspace and top high. um, And they're pretty much akin to like a runner's high, Mm -hmm. Uh which is what I would assume what you guys are probably feeling after a show, like buzzy and floaty and kind of like weird to string together words because you're just like running on an endorphin rush or something. Um, That's exactly it. yeah, so um, I think a lot of people who are into BDSM do seek out that sensation, and mm-hmm. that sensation in and of itself can be pretty escapist or just like hedonistic, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and and then um, the psych- and then the, you said no when when Brian asked if you thought that it was all like psychological or something, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. no, because like there are some people who just purely have straight fetishes, mm. like they. Maybe they just, like, want to be faced out on and, like, ass smothered or they just want to be kicked in the balls repeatedly huh. over and over and over again or they want to be trampled on. You know, there, yeah. are, there are people whose fetishes are, like, purely physical. So, see, that surprises me because my, my assumption, just, like, not knowing that much about it, was that I was always, like oh that's like that has to leave like something from their childhood you know like th- I always mm-hmm. like thought that it was like psychological so that's very interesting to hear um that I mean I think a lot of the triggers can happen starting from their childhood in that sense they are psychological yeah but like someone who just like really loves to see women in rubber you know mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a psychological thing they're just like oh that ass looks real shiny right now <laughs> you know yeah, that so, makes a lot um, of sense. Yeah. Can I also say just one thing really quickly about what you said about autism? And I, I just want to be careful. I don't want to come off as ableist or anything. Yeah. But I personally, because I have a lot of friends that are autistic, and a lot of them are into BDSM. And, you know, I, I'll hear mm-hmm. them discussing it. And they and it for me, I was like sort of picking up like, oh, I just like noticed on my own, like, oh, you know, I, I have friends who are autistic and they seem to like mm-hmm. more of them seem to really engage with this um and it i was seeing it too like i i I thought that for them maybe it was like helpful to have these sort of like rules and uh ways that you're supposed to do things correctly and incorrectly that uh, might you know for somebody that's on the spectrum that might be a little overwhelming you know because sex is so like Mm -hmm. people who are not doing bdsm and just having sex you know um it is very like it's like jazz you know like our friend mike yeah. called it it's just like you, you just gotta do whatever feels like you gotta do and, and so <laughs> I, I i was like formulating this thought on my own like oh i, th- I think maybe it, it is helpful for a lot of people um in a way to have this sort of this type of sexuality do you, yeah so what do you think about the fact that you have noticed that there are a lot of people like do you think that what I said is like accurate or do you feel similar? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I do feel similarly. I would actually be super interested in, if there were, if someone could conduct an informal study on like autism and BDSM, mm. because um, I find at least amongst my clients, I have like a lot more autistic clients in that cross section than I do in like the standard cross section of my friends or people I know in the world. Mm. Um, it, it just seems to be like a higher occurrence to me. And this is obviously 
just purely speculative because yeah. I'm only seeing it from my perspective and I've talked to a couple of other of my friends about it and I would say most of the pro doms I know would say that they see like a decent number of people who are autistic mm-hmm. um and yeah I do think there is something to be said for just the structure that BDSM can provide mm-hmm. yeah. um and it doesn't require parsing out kind of like uh just social like in betweens like yeah. well, did they really mean to do that when they said this right. and mm. so on and so forth you know um yeah. it's it's more just like i told you to kneel right there right put, put your hands yeah. and knees on all fours right don't move and if you move this is going to happen you know yeah. so right right it's very I mean, makes a lot of sense. it's very straightforward cause and effect and for it, a lot of them it, you know i think for anyone in the world they they can easily see that if you have this if you have this thing that's kind of scary to a lot of people and confusing and you know it is very like improvisational it, it is i can see how for anyone it would be very helpful and a little um comforting for you to have like this set of rules and things that you can follow is that's what i was gonna say yeah yeah um i think it but also like the things that I do, I would not say are relegated only to sex. Mm. Like I have a lot of clients who are interactions stem outside of like outside of that into yeah. like a more lifestyle service scenario where they want, they genuinely like want to help me. They want to drive me around. They want to clean things for me. Right. They want to just be of service. And so I think having that dynamic and an ongoing situation yeah. like makes it a, a little bit more clear what the, what the relationship is whereas when when you're like just partners or something you're like okay but like most i think most vanilla partners don't really compartmentalize like what our roles are in the relationship and i think in an ideal situation all these things should be laid out like here are the roles and here are the responsibilities so nobody Mm. feels resentment for these things yeah right but in a bdsm relationship you have to be a lot more clarified in like what things are and aren't okay like consent is negotiated exhaustively and renegotiated so that it's not really in a good bdsm relationship you are not left unknowing like what your job is and what your expectations are for your role you know it's Mm. like a it's like a well clarified job except you apply it to an an emotional setting right right that makes so much sense that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah um i wanted to shift gears a little bit and uh you know sex work at large has gotten more coverage in popular media um i guess like oftentimes by proxy of only fans mm-hmm. and in my opinion it feels it's almost glamorized even because you know mm-hmm. the, you, you read these articles about how much money these only fans content creators are making and i guess from your experience uh, what are some aspects of sex work that you feel are uh, often overlooked so the, my issue with like the glamorization of OnlyFans and all this stuff is that oftentimes they don't go over the fact that being a sex worker, at least in the U.S., like automatically disenfranchises you from a lot of things. Yeah. Um, like the money, the money can be really good. Yes. Um, but the money is good because the work in it itself comes with a lot of societal and physical dangers, depending on like what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think like I see a lot of, And I think this happens from what I understand from sex workers who have been around for a long time. Anytime there is a um, a major financial upset, a bunch of whole new sex workers come into the scene because like Mm. they lost their jobs. So like with the pandemic, there's been a huge rise of sex workers, like online sex workers, um, which is great because I'm happy that people can make money Mm -hmm. and find ways to support themselves without like becoming a frontline worker and endangering their family or something like that. Um, On the other hand, I think that oftentimes people go into it because they're like, oh, this person said they make 3000 bucks an hour doing so and so. And Mm -hmm. like, I could do that, too. And it's like, well, no, one, that person probably spent a lot of years getting to that point. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if they didn't spend a lot of years, it was more than likely a fluke. And two, like this is a this is a real job like any others. You will have to act like a business you're going Mm. to have to go through shitty things like any business and deal with clients you don't like Mm -hmm. Mm. and three and i think most importantly is that being a sex worker in the u in the u.s at least puts you at risk for like getting arrested Mm -hmm. getting your bank shut down getting um getting your payment apps shut down uh getting your social media shut down not being able to use airbnb Mm -hmm. like um just being associated or affiliated with sex workers can get multiple payment apps shut down i've had 
so many friends on their vanilla Airbnb accounts have their Airbnb accounts shut down because they they think it was associated with like the same IP oh. that they posted on mm-hmm. sex work advertising mm-hmm. sites. So um, a lot of this stuff can be it. It can make your life a lot more difficult, yeah. is what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of people don't really realize it. And outside of like we all know that you know if you become a sex worker and your family finds out that may or may not work out. Um, that's right. the, probably the most obvious social thing that people know, but there's a lot of legal ram- ramifications that come with it that mm. can make your life a lot more difficult. Yeah. yeah I, but I, I guess my follow-up question is with the whole conversation of sex work, like now entering the cultural zeitgeist and, you know, all, only fans, it's just like any other startup people know about it. People talk mm-hmm. about it. Would you still say that the net outcome has been like positive perhaps with this stigmatization? Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm surprising my, myself here when I say this, but I think there has been a net positive mm-hmm. in that sex. When I first started doing sex work eight years ago, um, sex work decriminalization was not a thing that any politician said. It just, nobody talked about it. It wasn't on anybody's docket mm-hmm. at all. Like we were too busy focusing on other bigger things. And, you know, with good reason, like fucking, Loads of fucking black people are still getting arrested and all this stuff. There's like, mm-hmm. quote unquote, bigger pl- problems at play. Mm-hmm. So I totally fucking get it. Um, uh, at the same time, like, uh, I just did not think decriminalization would ever become a thing in my lifetime. And mm-hmm. in this past election, I've heard multiple politicians talk about sex work decriminalization. Um, it's interesting because I feel like even though we are take we in the past couple of years have taken a step back and a step forward. Mm -hmm. We've taken a step back in regards to like Visa and MasterCard have been staunchly against sex work and have been shutting down loads of accounts on all these adult sites and making it really hard for us to earn money. But at the same time, people have been talking about sex work decriminalization. So I don't, I don't really know. And then there's also this whole thing, this whole dialogue about, like sex trafficking that's mm-hmm. always like some fucking dumb internet bitches want to talk about it. it's like do you know anyone who's been trafficked because it's not some fucking white van who picks you up off the street mm-hmm. and like all of a sudden turns you into like a fucking like working out of a cheap motel it's always it's almost always like someone you know like a fucking oh. your father your brother your boyfriend yep. and so there's all these like super hyper inflated <sighs> sex trafficking st- stats that are just literally not true they're not based on any real studies yeah. and they've been completely falsified and um i'll go on fucking twitter and like i try to avoid getting to arguments with people on this anymore but it's like they're like yeah well like you know like yeah sure you, you you're like a sex worker but there's loads of people getting trafficked and it's like yes there are but like where are you getting your numbers from yeah um it's, it's a, just uh yeah sorry sorry um it's so yeah, fake fake news everywhere. Fake news everywhere, but at least people are talking about sex work decrim. The, this is the thing, I think, about sex work. I, just to get very big picture with it, you know, how sex work is treated is just stupid and bad. Like, from, from the root of it, from the root of mm-hmm. our society, it's like a rotten root yeah. and it'll never go away. And in every society in the world, how we view it is wrong, it's misogynistic, and it's harmful to the yeah. people involved in it. Like, and, and yeah. everyone who, you know, and so it feels like they're already, like, all these arguments um, against sex work and even people that, like, think that they understand it. They're starting their knowledge base like on a root, on a tree, which roots are like r- rotten. So the arguments are all like, yeah. we're all, it's such a mess. But I think down, you know, when we just think about it in like a human level, it's it's something that happens. It's always going to happen. The people mm-hmm. who um, are involved in it, whether it's the people that work in it or the people that um, pa- like patronize it. There's nothing morally corrupt about it if if it's done in a safe and consensual way, and we yeah. have to like really. I, I think the the biggest main issue of the whole issue and how messy it is is that s- historically it's always the the blame is always placed on the person who's selling it because historically that person exactly. is usually a woman, and our all yeah. our societies are misogynistic, 
And I think yeah. we really have to, all of us, like, take a second and be like, throughout, since the dawn of time, we've had this happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And since the dawn of time, you've tried to say that it's all our fault. And mm. that's yeah. fucked up. And we need to really sit down and say, it's if we're, if we're both participating, we're both at fault. And both of us need to get, you know, if it's quote unquote so wrong, which I personally don't believe yeah. in at all. But if, you, yeah, yeah. if you're saying it's wrong... We need to focus on the person that's also doing it too. And we need to stop this like obsession with criminalizing the workers and the people that provide it. Yeah. And I, uh, sorry. I'm Absolutely. Not. But like to well, your point, the thing about the people like trying to fight for these people that are being trafficked and stuff, it's like everyone in the world agrees that no, no child should be trafficked for sex, but it's very, yes. that's very different than like what you do or like what people do yeah. on OnlyFans and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the the fact is that the laws that are surrounding trafficking also disproportionately affect a bunch of consensual workers as well, which mm. is pretty frustrating. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's also just like, so for example, fucking Instagram. I hate Instagram. I hate Instagram as a sex worker because I've had my account shut down. I couldn't even tell you how many times for like innocuous photos. And then I'll go on and then I'll see some fucking Instagram influencer or some fucking A-list celebrity with like full on nips out. And it's, it's art, you know, and I can't even show a fucking covered buck cheek Mm -hmm. because I'm a whore. And it's, um, at what point, how do you, how do you do, how do you delineate what is trafficking and what is not? Is this person who is like an A-list celebrity absolutely just, you know, going to be okay, even though they're showing way more skin because they're famous. And then me who, like, I'm clearly consensual, but I still, I fall under different categories than this, like, verified influencer. Mm-hmm. And, of course, my sh- my shit's going to get it shut down. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It drives me, it drives me nuts. It drives me and nuts. And I wanted to say one thing about the OnlyFans and uh, versus, like, what you were saying about the people that don't know how harmful it is because our society is so misogynistic and anti-sex work they enter it without knowing because the people that run only fans who are I'm, I'm assuming billionaire white people because that's who owns everything mm-hmm. are tricking them into like making content and money for them without revealing the hand of well you're gonna basically be considered a criminal B- but we're yeah. we're not. We're gonna make a bunch of money off you. But we're just bus- yeah. we're just nice like businessmen. You know what I mean? And it's like yeah, yeah. So there's like so so supposedly I I'd never verified this, but from what I understand, the person who created OnlyFans, I think he ripped off the code from another sex worker who created like what OnlyFans is derived from. Of course. And so he like actively stole it from a sex worker and then profited making billions off of sex worker dollars and then tried to kick us all off and be like no it's not a sex worker thing even though he clearly stole it from a sex worker and now that all the sex workers started to leave he's like never mind just kidding we're, we're staying on sex worker friendly again but you're not allowed to mention all of these things unless you're a celebrity i guess i don't know you know what it reminds me of and i love this story sorry i know we're running out of time you know like those i don't even know if i've said this on the podcast you know those hot springs in japan and sapporo yeah, <laughs> there was like yeah. there's like monkeys that like swim in. The, do you know about the monkeys? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know mm-hmm. what happened with the monkeys? So there were people swimming in the natural hot springs, and one monkey one day saw them. I think they're like baboons. I don't know what they are. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And like, and the monkey like went in the hot tub, and and I'm assuming it was a it was a female monkey. Just saying, and she was like, "Yes, this is amazing." So she went back and told all the other monkeys, and then like the alpha male monkey got in there and then he wouldn't let anyone in unless they were his friends that's so that's funny. the o- that's the owner of only fans okay that's, that's what he did no and, and then now that you know the girls are all there like this was my hot spring yeah yeah <sighs> sorry that was weird okay <laughs> no. i just want to uh i don't know i might i don't know if there's time for this but i just want to tack on this other conversation point but um you know, this com- like we, uh, there are a lot of celebrities that come on to OnlyFans now, and uh, I once and I, I'm going to admit, I'm going to say up top, like my opinion on this, it it, it wasn't met. Uh, p- people found it like kind of uh, no. I'm going to say, so I was asked on a podcast about what my take was on this, about how mm. like well, celebrities are now pivoting into OnlyFans content creators, and I had like a more capitalistic approach to it i'm certainly open to 
being wrong in this case and being taught like told why these views are wrong i saw so what i said was uh i didn't really see an issue with it because i just leave it up to like free market capitalism like if there's a demand and people want to pay for it then by all means like they should have mm -hmm. the agency to do so what is your like do you have an opinion on these like larger influencers yeah. entering the space and it, do you agree with Absolutely. me disagree like uh, yeah so mm. my issue is less based on celebrities making money on membership sites like you know by all means fucking do whatever you want with that my issue is that when celebrities go in it's going to push the sex workers out mm. because mm. only fans is going to be like okay well say we're p pulling in i don't know like fucking one million a day from this celebrity right. why the fuck should we keep on all these other people when we have the easy money that is the celebrities and mm -hmm. i think I think that was the goal of OnlyFans to begin with, mm. was to ride on the backs of sex workers to get fame and then kick all the sex workers out so then they could have the easy money of the celebrities. Mm. And this is this is how a lot of technologies and like innovations have worked in the past where like for example paypal was meant to be was originally a like um a payment avenue for online porn i believe mm. and that's how it started and now they are staunchly against adult work mm -hmm. like any kind of sign and they will shut you down immediately like they are oh. super super against it um and companies have a habit of doing this like technological companies specifically where they use the hard work that sex workers have come and done and like built them up and then they disavow us once it's convenient for them. And I just think that's not right. You know, yeah. it's like we were the reason you gained any foothold in economy to begin with. Yep. Um, mm. And so I think the presence of vanilla celebrities coming in is only an indicator that they're getting ready to push us out once they have enough clout with celebrities is mm. how I view it. And yeah. when, when you mean by pushing out, like banning explicit content and then like yes. changing the platform altogether to cater to yes. okay okay that makes Cause, sense because only fans did that in october i believe they okay. they started they banned explicit content for like i want to say five days or so wow. right and everyone fucking freaked out and we're like okay we're all leaving mass exodus and none of us can make money anymore right and then they fucking changed their mind and they mm. were like oh never mind we're not ready yet just kidding we're keeping yeah. explicit content um well yeah. yeah so i think a lot of people yeah. oh that i that also just brings up a point like i think a lot of this is like it could be like an hours long conversation i think so many <laughs> corporations and people that want to make money use the fake moral thing to get a leg up like what you said because they know that sex workers can't have legitimate businesses or whatever right so they will like use what they use their work and let legitimate legitimatize it in their company or whatever you know what i mean and i feel like that that's yeah. true for like a lot of stuff that's like viewed as you know criminal i think period right i see yeah anyway wow. yeah well thank you thank you for uh elucid like clarifying and elucidating uh so those fascinating. For me because you know I, I obviously i have blind spots in my belief system and w w when i was asked that i was like yeah it's a free market anyone should be able to do what they yeah. want it's like comedians yeah. like celebrities become yeah. comedians all the time and i can't be upset they have built a following but now i see that the issue is that when the platform is built off of sex workers and then turns their back against them then yeah. it becomes more of an issue and i think yeah. it's also like the issue with the free market idea is that it actively overlooks disenfranchised groups who are never right. going to be in a privileged place to profit from it to begin with, you yes. know? So like, for example, yeah. us as Asians, um, like we are, companies are always going to think we cater to a smaller audience than say a white blonde person. Yep. And it's not really an issue of free market. It's an issue of like biases and mm -hmm. like, oftentimes racism you know there's mm. it's never just like oh the the winner wins you mm -hmm. know it's, it's never as easy as mm -hmm. that it's right, always right. there's always more issues of like we should probably do more to help the disenfranchised groups in it and e equal the playing ground exactly so, it's like yeah. this, just a really quick thing and then we'll, I, i'm like realizing my monkey like analogy didn't make sense so now i gotta like fake now i gotta like <laughs> 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 I gotta, I gotta win back the listeners because they think I'm stupid. Um, okay, so look, the, you know, like the the recently it came out in the article showing for in Forbes the top earners for TikTok, and they're all white, and mm. it's okay. weird because there are black creators sure. that have similar like the second I, I believe the second most popular creator on TikTok is black. The first one is that that white dancing girl. I'm not gonna say I don't know her name is, 
Charlie, I think. And so then like these two people are like neck and neck and followers. And he, the the black creator didn't even make it on the top 10 of the oh, wow. earners. It's all white right. people. It's like that. It's like, okay, yeah. so you're saying that I can win if I try really hard, but I did win. Like this black creator mm. did yeah. is neck and neck with all these other white creators, but why am I not making the same money? And that's, you, that's, you're yeah. wrong. It's not free doesn't, market. Something fucked up's happening. Yeah. And it, I mean, doesn't TikTok also have a beauty algorithm that fav- favors white faces? Yes. So it's yeah. like even even all these Tech other stuff. little issues where it's like y- you think it you think it's free market stuff, but there's all these like little other details leading up to it that prevent mm. other people who are not the like ideal to yeah. make it. Yeah, you know? it's all about the yeah. big monkey wow. that wants to let his monkey friends in. I'm bringing that back. I'm gonna, I'm sticking to my <laughs> weird story that doesn't make sense. You know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Damn. Well. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This has been really eye opening for me. So yeah, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing uh, with us. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna go into the second half of our uh, podcast new format. And Anli, what's something that you're loving right now? Um, I am <laughs> gonna be a fan girl. Be like, I'm loving the fact that I'm on this show because I feel like half of the people I went to high school with, which I went to like an 88 percent Asian high school, nice. so like half of them are going to realize that this is me oh um God, the ones who did not realize that i'm a fucking sex worker now hello Whoa. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just like stoked to be on this show because you guys are i feel like you guys are like the asian american celebrities we only have yeah, so really? many so you guys are yeah dude like i like frequently send your fucking uh tiktok thingies to my cousins and my friends who are asian oh, thank you so I'm just, I'm just saying. I also, uh, my cousins will be mad at me if I don't say hi to them here. So, like, hi, Brenda and Kami. Hi. Because uh, <laughs> we, uh, we all talk about you guys. Aww. So this is kind of surreal. So I'm just like stoked to be here. I'm like really happy to be here. And then, outside of that, um, I'm just stoked that I have a living where I can do something I love and, like, actually be comfortable doing it. And. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where I am today, even though I'm very concerned I'm going to get COVID tomorrow. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so that's something I'm proud of. Oh, I, what, oh, wait, this? we said happy, but. Oh, happy. Um, did we? What are you loving? Oh, that's, uh, I mean, what are you loving? Oh, the, I mean, loving? I'm loving that. Well, we can. Okay. Oh, no, no, you did. Oh, I'm also. You did say um, you're yeah, yeah, loving yeah. being on this pod. You did. Yeah. Um, um, uh, and the, I'm like uh, other. Uh, 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 that uh, ends. <laughs> what's something you're hating right now? Um, I am hating the idea of getting COVID. I'm really fixated wow. on this idea right now. It's just been like running over my head. I hate the idea of getting COVID during a pandemic. <laughs> um, and I hate the state of sex work. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate the anti-trafficking groups like Polaris. What is it? Polaris and Exodus Cry are the ones that you should not listen to. Um, I hate banking c- companies and financial institutions, and I hate. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to go with those. I hate those. And I just want to clarify that we, I mean, we obviously we hate trafficking, but you just hate these certain groups because they they don't know what they're talking yes. about and they're like messing it up. Yes. Is what I'm yeah. assuming that you're saying. Yeah, of, nobody obviously. nobody wants trafficking. Not nobody. a single person is okay with trafficking unless you are fucking just like not okay. And like let's be so. really honest, even the people that do stuff like that, they're like probably, you know, in a bad place. Probably hate themselves. They yeah. Hate themselves cuz they were I'm not trying to say let's pity the traffickers or anything, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> listeners, this is the portion of the podcast that we hide behind a paywall at Patreon. So if you're listening to this, you can donate to hear um, on Lee's answer to the question, what is something that you're ashamed of? Um, well, Anli, uh, before we let you go, uh, we want to ask you one last question that we like to ask all of our guests. And that is, and I know it might be caked into an earlier your answer to what you're loving, but what is something that you're proud of? Okay, so I am, I guess this is tied back in uh, to proud of um, or loving. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I have been able to do this for as long as I have mm. and um, am able to happily sustain myself doing it. Like given some years are better than others, but I'm still, I think, when I think of some of my friends who have office jobs that they like dread going mm-hmm. to, 
And then I think about my job where I'm like, I get to punch this dude in the ball for three balls for like three hours straight <laughs> yes. and like listen to him cry. And it's like super yes. fun. It's like, you know, it's just it's super fun. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I do consider myself super lucky. Mm. And it's also a, a job where there aren't really directions on how you should go about doing this. So I've kind of had to like figure it out from talking to other friends and just like trying to understand how they made their careers work. And I think it took, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pat myself on the back and say that it, it took a lot of bravery mm. on my end to kind of enter into this, not knowing how the fuck I would do yeah. it, but just trusting that like I could do it at some point. So I'm pretty proud of what I do. Yeah. Well, this is such an excellent conversation. This is like, I just feel like I learned so much and um, it went to places where, you know, I didn't really even, anticipate and i just learned so much and i'm so proud of you and all the work that you do too i'm like so yeah. excited for th i'm so proud of this sort of representation i feel like you know this sort of um you know going against the grain of what people expect from asians and doing uh, doing well at it and having the bravery and the courage to be really true to yourself and um do what you do and do what you want to do and i feel like that's the absolutely most bravest most respectful thing that i've ever seen in a person so absolutely oh, thank you <laughs> and yeah just but. thank you again for being so vulnerable and sharing your story and uh i apologize i did the annoying white guy thing of like teach me why i'm wrong teach me why, <laughs> why my belief play... system's wrong yeah. not i mean play I, devil's I, I advocate but I uh, yeah, but yeah. thank you. This was a this was a very eye opening and illuminating conversation. And thanks for being so patient and uh, and thoughtful and tolerant. So yeah. yeah. And for our listeners, where can they find you online? Um, sure. My I don't really use Instagram anymore. But if you want to follow me, and I deleted most of my photos on there because they kept on removing uh. me. But if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's mistress dot on mistress underscore only no mr yeah mistress underscore only on instagram on twitter it's daddy underscore only um and my website is you're my bitch y-o-u-r-e-m-y-b-i-t dot c-h yeah great nice Thanks. how and about you what Brian? about you young me oh we said at the same time ym mayor on social media <laughs> young me mayor on tiktok um and check out oh and what about you brian where can they find brian Oh, you guys can follow me online at It's Brian Park. And yeah, check out our podcast. I think that's what you were going to say next. I was, right? yeah. Our podcast <laughs> is Feeling Asian, podcasts everywhere. We have a YouTube channel, the same name. Leave us a review if you like our podcast. And check out our Patreon for weekly bonus episodes. Um, and to hear what An Lee said she was ashamed of. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. If you made it this far, it's time to do some Patreon shoutouts. And just a quick reminder, if you like the podcast and you're looking for ways to support us, you can do so at Patreon at patreon.com slash feelingasian. Youngmi and I, we offer different subscription tiers with different benefits. Go check it out. But any donation amount gets you a shout out on the podcast. And let's do some shoutouts for this week. So first up, we have Kevin Schweitzer. Kevin, you are Hapa. You're a skater. And my and you have buzz head, pink dyed hair, and the real ones know that Evan Mock actually copied your style. So kudos to you for being a true OG. Next shout out goes out to Mer Marie Billiel. Marie, you run marathons and don't tell anyone about it. Next shout out goes out to Jade Hidley. Jade, I feel like you have your shit together. You compost. You own a Chemex. You have a diverse stock portfolio. You volunteer on the weekend. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that you are the child my parents wished I had become. So, kudos to you for just, for just being a great person overall. Uh, next shout-out goes out to Denise Warzak. Denise, you call things for what they are. You're a straight shooter. You're incredibly funny, but people who don't know you are intimidated by you, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, but 
Uh, that's that's my assessment. That's my guess, my psychic guess for you. And our last shout out for this episode goes out to Eileen Pan. Eileen, I am going to guess that you live in San Francisco and you are a software engineer. Now, it's nothing personal. It's This is just purely a statistics thing. I haven't guessed that someone is a software engineer in a while, and we're due for one, and you're it. So, uh, you know, hopefully the company you work for is IPO'd, and you are a multi, multi, multi millionaire. So, congratulations, and thank you for supporting the podcast. And once again, thank you to all of our supporters, and if you'd like to do so, you could do so at patreon.com slash feelingasian.